how do you see the field nowadays, the DR field and the changes for good or for bad since you began working on it? I mean, you could reflect on the gender issues, but also more widely as the field has dramatically changed in terms of bringing in resilience and climate issues and other dimensions. But how do you see it now? And do you see it as a positive development or are there still a lot of challenges to, to be dealt with? Uh, both actually <laughs> positive and still a lot of challenges so it's a it's a lot uh, I think there's a recognition of complexity now that was not there early on and there was a very you know, early early days very technocratic um, approach and a sense that there is a right answer and a wrong answer um, whereas now, I think we recognize there are a whole series of possible answers, um, depending on who you're asking and, and who is doing the asking. So um, there's a recognition of that complexity, but um, we, ha we haven't really cracked it in terms of how to deal with that complexity, because there still is we're we are all really forced into um, silos in various ways by our, you know, our regional training or discipline backgrounds. Um, and then uh, the, the, the policy frameworks that are also siloed, the, the UN mandates, you know, do not cross this line. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't step on my toes, you know, keep, in, keep to your own mandate. I mean, I think there's, there's more of an appetite of trying to work together and go beyond that and break down those silos. But so much is set against it, and particularly in terms of how the budget flows. You know, the budget is attached to this policy area, not this policy area. And uh, trying trying to bring things together uh, is, uh, is, that's a, a real challenge. In the UK, our um, national research councils um, organized under the umbrella of the UKRI, UK Research Innovation, they have been trying for the last several years to encourage interdisciplinary working. And a lot of the calls require interdisciplinary working. Um, it's not always interdisciplinary, it's more multidisciplinary, I'd say. It's been you know, a collection of different disciplines in the same place without necessarily really uh, working together and, and uh, in that synergistic way. So I think there's still a challenge in terms of uh, getting some synergy out of um, these kinds of interdisciplinary approaches. But it's definitely on the agenda now as something that people feel we need to be doing that. Uh, and that's not to detract from the importance of specialism, again, really going deep into a particular subject area, um, which is still of, of value. Uh, but the interdisciplinary approaches are still devalued to a considerable extent, um, particularly in academia, where you, are, you, you really are judged on the extent to which you support a particular disciplinary, disciplinary area um, and the, you know, the top journals in that discipline are the ones to publish in. And if you work inter, in an interdisciplinary way, it's, it's, it's seen as weakening um, to some extent. So there's still a challenge there. Uh, over the years, you know, the, the language has changed. Uh, natural disasters is now well and truly hammered, uh, still used, but, uh, but is constantly um, uh, uh, critiqued. Um, community based approaches um, have have come to the fore, really, and there's, there's almost a you know, expectation that this is required in, uh, in a developing country's context, but it's still not 
it's not done very well in a developed country um, context, I think. So there's definitely work to be done there. Uh, the, the, the language in terms of the, uh, well, the continuing um, value of the, the vulnerability paradigm, but for me coming from a, a gendered background, vulnerability has always been a sort of two-edged sword really because um, yes the early days were all about recognizing the vulnerability created um, for women particularly um, but that ended up um, with a response that assumed women were vulnerable which equals weak um, and needing to have things done for them. You know, they, it was a more of a charity case than a question of rights in equal rights. So the, the vulnerability paradigm um, has been extremely successful in highlighting the um, discriminatory uh, actions against particular social groups. But um, like all of these terms, sustainability, resilience, if they have any power at all, they get appropriated and they get watered down in that process. So they're appropriated and they're reformed um, so that they're less risky, less dangerous, less challenging. Uh, and so they've become part of part of the norm, part of the everyday, and lose that kind of radical edge, which was where they began. And so something like resilience, for example, about which there must be so many words written. Um, it, it's, it, it can be useful. And I think it can be useful to all sorts of people. It's, uh, if, if you pursue the, uh, the, the, uh, the critique of the resilience term, uh, then you can see the way it's used to, uh, to shift responsibility from the state to non-state actors and to, uh, to communities and um, vulnerable social groups themselves to take responsibility with this notion of uh, that it's all about building resilience or, or just saying uh, these groups are so resilient. You know, they, they, they talk about children being res so resilient. It's almost as if it, it excuses terrible things from happening because these particular groups are going to bounce back um, so it's used in this very dangerous way, but it can also be used in a, in a more positive way um, in, in the sense that it, it can potentially flip this notion of, um, of the, the passive vulnerable woman as a classic example to a resilient person who is an active agent in their lives and um, and recognized as a as a leader in their field so and after a lot of uh, advocacy and um, part of the negotiation processes around Kyogo framework for action Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction um, those those sort of policy environments uh, eventually would recognize women's leadership as something that does occur and that also must be, uh, must, must be nurtured. And how we deal with an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to what we do and how we um, now reconfigure our ideas about 
gender. What do we mean when we talk about gender? Um, uh, into something that's much more fluid. That is still a, that's still a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge politically. It's a challenge in practical terms about how to manage this you know, for those who need to manage things. Um, but it's a challenge politically when in so many parts of the world, uh, if you step outside of an, uh, a, um, a heterosexual bubble, um, you're, you're then in, in the realms of the, the illegal. So uh, that opens up a whole other uh, series of challenges. Are you connected with the whole LGBTQ community? And is that where also the Gender and Disaster Network kind of now have an additional role to play or because yes. I, mean, definitely, I think 20 years ago this was not on on the radar screen of of many people uh, or transgender issues in and 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 disaster vulnerability but now nowadays it's very much in the media but i i couldn't think of any other network really focusing on on this issue and uh, nowadays yes we're very much uh, um <clears throat> concerned with that and um, we have been for um, a number of years, I don't know, maybe a decade actually, but <coughs> uh, in the early days of bringing in those kinds of questions, uh, I would notice on the Gender and Disaster Network that after there'd been uh, an active exchange of posts about uh, an LGBT, as it was you know, only thought of as LGBT, uh, it's acquired a few more initials since then. Um, if we had a discussion around that, uh, I would get uh, membership sign-offs happening. Oh, wow! Uh, it, it's interesting because I, you know, I I, I get all the membership um, requests and approvals, and uh, I also see people signing off, uh, and there would be. You know, I, now, I don't know because I never followed it up to ask them why they left, but it was, uh, you know, this, it was synchronous in time. There's less of that happening now. And we do have, you know, we have a link to LGBT resources um, and there's a kind of subgroup now <clears throat> of uh, discussion. So there's, uh, there's more discussion taking place um, around LGBT issues outside of the, the, the main L, um, GDN network to avoid all you know what we said before but we still uh, we still have a, a much more broad-based notion of what we mean by gender and some people go along with it and some people don't um, but you know it it's a, a very broad-based network the gender and disaster network it isn't a you know and my I, I uh i try to intervene as little as possible i mean we will intervene to um to disallow any um, very negative um, posts and also with suggestions that uh I don't think you really mean this in your in your post, but this is the way it's going to be received. You want to just reword that before you post it. So it's a very, very light touch. Um, so you will get you know, a whole range of, of responses on there. But yeah, yeah maybe, that, then, maybe to conclude, uh, I mean, climate change and climate adaptation has definitely had a huge influence on the on the DRR field to the extent even that people sometimes question are they one and the same which definitely they're not uh, but uh, I presume from a, a climate perspective there's also been a lot of people working around gender issues uh, and I was like wondering and this is definitely a, a bigger community than even the gender and disaster network how how does that collaboration work on on these specific uh, issues because I mean it, there's still a constant struggle to bring the wider communities but if you work on a specific topic it may 
be easier or it may be more challenging. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. So. Yeah. Uh, it, originally, we didn't differentiate um, <clears throat> uh, and climate issues were all part of disaster issues. Um, the same way as you know, it, disaster issues are not those with an environmental trigger, but they could be a social or bi biological trigger. Um, so it was all part of the same piece um, uh, in, in the minds of many of us. And then suddenly, uh, gender and climate emerged as if it were a totally new field. And, and the other interesting thing about it was, of course, that it attracted money. So it was actually, it was a funded um, uh, field. There were many more resources that were attached to it then and now, in fact. So um, the, the collaboration comes usually through um, uh, the women's major group, you know, part of the UN systems of major groups. So there is the women's major group um, and we are the official um, pathway to, uh, to make, uh, make our case to the UN system. Um, and allied to that is the uh, uh, women and gender constituency, which has a much more um, uh, climate focus. And it means that we are rallying around often different policy frameworks, uh, although you know, some of us work across, uh, say, the Sendai framework for action, uh, and, and then also would be involved in COP um, uh, and, and climate uh, framework discussions. But each of them requires so much effort and energy. And for most people, they're doing it as an extra. They're doing it you know, like, like me. It's an all voluntary, it's, it's all extra to the day job. Um, so there's only so much that people can do, uh, but there ha and and I think it's fine for there to be these um, separate initiatives, but there needs to be points of contact. Um, so we we do try and engage with um, uh, with not just climate but also with the SDGs as well, uh, and meetings that will try and bring those things together. Um, so you know, some, some people work more on one than the other, some solely on one or the other, and some work across. Um, because, because I'm involved with networks, I, I tend to work more generally, but I don't have the time to really uh, focus on more than the, the DRR uh, track, really, personally. Okay, thanks so much, Maureen. I think it's been very insightful uh, to, and I know you're very busy, but uh, uh, for I think future generations to be able to to watch the video and understand how how gender came into the work and also how you played a major role in that is really really great. And uh, uh, I wish you all the best and thanks a lot for the interview. <laughs>